Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. As we begin and return to Numbers chapter 23, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his direction, and for his wisdom, so that we may more directly see the symbols in this chapter that we are about to read and how they relate to what we are going to see occur in the world around us. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the examples that are provided within your word. We thank you for the ability that we have to be able to read these, to be able to seek your wisdom and your guidance so that we may more properly understand the example and the story that is being provided for us. Direct us now so that all that we do in our conversation, in our thoughts, may glorify you. Help us to understand these items. May your spirit guide us. May your angels attend us. May that which we do bring glory to you and to your character, now and always. For this we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Numbers 22, or excuse me, 23. We begin looking at this with Balak's sacrifice. Now, as we come to this, we have Balaam's first parable. Balak then sacrifices again, <clears throat> and we come to Balaam's second parable. Then we find that Balak is displeased with Balaam, but bringeth him to the top of Peor and sacrifice there. How much time have we spent to try to understand Balaam's parables that are contained within this chapter? And why would Balaam be said to, to be providing parables? When you consider this, here is Balaam, a man that is no longer a true prophet, yet he is providing parables, much as the Savior did. Each of these parables you will find are prophetic. Would we then also make this same application about the parables of Christ being prophetic? Or were the parables of Christ lessons for us to learn alone? Well, they're definitely prophetic. I mean, the parable of the ten virgins is a prophecy. It, I mean, I mean, obviously there are lessons in it, but its main purpose is actually prophetic. Okay. Now, as scripture reads, And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me seven oxen and seven rams. So, seven altars are being requested. 
And Balak did as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. Balak and Balaam. Now, are these offerings being done in accordance with the, uh, the way that offerings were to be presented by the children of Israel? Well, Ellen White says <laughs> and had some knowledge of the sacrificial offerings of the Hebrews. Right. And, and we're, and we're we'll, see, yeah. we'll see that in just a moment. Yeah. Now, um, so one of the things I think that's happening here is, um, you know, the question is, why is Balaam um, appealing to to the God of the Israelites? And And it seems like, well, I mean, I know that um, there was all these regional gods. I mean, people people sort of acknowledged all these different gods existed, and they and Balaam would have looked at the god of the Israelites as just a regional god or a god specific to a people, and he would have felt that the only way he could curse them would be to have their god involved. So he's he's in a sense appealing to to God as if God is some kind of pagan God, uh, but God somehow ends up communicating with him uh, specifically in spite of this fact. So it's kind of a point of the story that we never really address because Balaam is not really a, a God of the Israelites. Obviously he's not an Israelite and yet he's trying to mimic the offerings of the Israelites. But the SLP does say he was God's prophet and a good man until he turned. Right, but he wasn't an Israelite prophet. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah, but he's still appealing to to God in a sense as as if God is just one of the pagan gods. Okay, so this this is a a reason behind my question yesterday. Does Balaam represent more than just the United States? Well, it would represent at least the religious aspect of the United States. Okay. I mean, at least that. So, I mean, even if we say Balaam represents the U.S., he seems to be more a religious figure or prophetic figure. Um, so the fact that the United States is the false prophet because of its connection to uh, Protestant, you know, Protestantism uh, going into apostasy, uh, Balaam sort of represents that aspect of the United States. <laughs> okay. And Balaam said unto Balak, stand by thy burnt offering, and I will go. For adventure, the Lord will come to meet me. And whatsoever he showeth me, I will tell thee. And he went into an high place. And God met Balaam, and he said unto him, I have prepared seven altars, and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. Now, for some reason, my system did not copy properly the document that I had prepared. Give me just a moment, please. Okay. Yeah, so one thing, uh, just while you're doing that, uh, in looking at the spirit of prophecy here, um, she says that um, by Balaam's direction, seven altars were erected, and, and he offered a sacrifice upon each. He then withdrew to a high place to meet with God, promising to make known to Balak whatever the Lord should reveal. So, so she sums that basically up with these uh, two sentences. 
Um, and, and we can see that Balaam does offer sacrifice, whatever that part, part he plays in that, I don't know. Um, but he then goes to a high place. Now, a high place would be, you know, basically um, not the way that the Israelites would approach God. This is sort of a pagan um, type of worship. But he does meet with God, and God speaks to him. So I, I just find it kind of an interesting story how God is is speaking to Balaam. And if he represents the religious aspect of the United States, then we would have to try to understand how this um, relates to God speaking to, to Balaam in some way. How does that come about? Just like we did with, with the ass, um, now as we look at this story of the the relationship between God speaking to Balaam, um, it shows us something about how we are to understand these these oracles or prophecies or parables. Okay. I hope this uh, this other one is coming through clearly. Um. Okay, so you got so which file are you showing us? That's okay. Numbers twenty three A. That's the yes. Okay. Because for some reason it would not copy as numbers twenty three. <clears throat> okay. Now, so when Balaam said unto Balak, build me here seven altars. What I found interesting was that the translators gave immediate reference to one of the verses at the end of this chapter, which is 2329. Where again, Balaam said unto Balak, build me here seven altars and prepare me seven bullocks and seven rams. Now, and Balak did as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. Again, Numbers 23.30 repeats exactly that. So the beginning and the ending of this chapter are going to be identical we're going to open it the same way as it closes and balaam said unto balak stand by thy burnt offering and i will go peradventure the lord will come to meet me and whatsoever he showeth me i will tell thee and he went to an high place but the alternate reading is that he went solitary. He went alone to a high place. Why would this be important that Balaam went alone to a high place? Yeah, I'm not sure why they add the word alone there. I'm adding alone. It said he went solitary. Yeah, a solitary. Well, solitary whether it's alone, but why they would add it, I'm not certain. Because it doesn't have it in the Hebrew. All right. How uh, does the Hebrew have it? Just, well, I'm going to look at it a bit more closely here. Um, I'm trying to figure out what they're doing. Does it, there's nothing about solitary in here at all. It just doesn't have a word for it. Okay. <clears throat> so 
Uh, yeah, there's no word that can be translated solitary. All right. And God met Balaam, and he said unto him, and Balaam said unto God, I have prepared. Actually, sorry. Uh, yeah, so there is a word here back a bit in the sentence. Um, but I'm not sure. Um, it's. It's the number 7200, zero, zero. but it's the one that says to go to see, to appear. Um, okay, no, no, never mind. So, yeah, so there is nothing there that would say he went solitary to a high place. It just he went to a high place. Okay, so I was just checking that. Okay. And God met Balaam, and he said unto him, and Balaam said unto God, as if God were a man, I have prepared seven altars, and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. Now, in this situation here again, Later in the chapter, we are told that the Lord met Balaam and put a word into his mouth and said, go again unto Balak and say thus. <clears throat> so we're going to find that this is going to be repeated throughout this passage. Now, what you were referring to earlier from Signs of the Times, December 2nd of 1880. Balaam had some knowledge of the sacrificial offerings of the Hebrews. And he thought that by surpassing them in costly gifts, he might secure the divine blessing and ensure the accomplishment of his sinful projects. Thus, the sentiments of the idolatrous Moabites were gaining control of his mind. Surely, his wisdom had become foolishness. His spiritual vision was beclouded. He had brought blindness upon himself by yielding to the power of Satan. What does this sentence say to you? This doesn't say anything. Well, it says lots of different things. Um, what is the overarching sentiment in this one statement? Well, it has to do with being able to see clearly. They divorce, uh, divorce of wives. Would you please repeat that? I didn't quite understand. I was just thinking of uh, divorcing the wives. Okay. You know, thinking of that scripture there. All right. Balaam ordered seven altars to be erected, and with a zeal worthy of a better cause, he offered upon each altar an ox and a ram. He then withdrew to a high place to meet with God, promising to make known to Balak whatever the Lord should reveal. <clears throat> Balaam had been greatly terrified by his encounter with the angel on the journey to Moab. But now he flattered himself that by his offerings, 
the divine anger would be appeased. And his first words on entering the presence of God were an enumeration of these sacrifices on Baal's heights. But had they been offered without repentance, faith, obedience, or love, by hearts that were filled with enmity, enmity to God, his ways, and his purposes. He who is perfect in wisdom and holiness cannot accept the fruit of hypocrisy, of covetousness, and malice. Balaam in a way, was also of the same mindset as was Cain. Cain wanted to offer the fruits of his labor as a sacrifice. Balaam wanted to offer a proper sacrifice, but without worship. Does Balaam represent those at the end of the world who cry for a return to spiritual prosperity but will not agree to honor the law of God? Mm -hmm. Which would be the United States. <clears throat> yes, agreed. I mean, that sort of, to me, seems to be the spirit of the United States um, from perspective of being a Canadian and not really knowing much. But Americans um, definitely are much more focused on the idea of prosperity as, as evidences that God is with you. I, I don't know if other people would agree with me, but um, yeah, and you don't necessarily have to follow God. Just the very fact that you are prosperous, God is somehow blessing you. Yeah, I can see that here. I mean, it's probably to some degree, uh, you know, uh, something in human nature, but it just seems more manifest in the United States. Um, that success is, um, and I think there's, you know, part of there's what we see in the world is a reaction to that as well. But the idea that success is in worldly prosperity, that's, that's how you measure success. I mean, I'm sure lots of people do all around the world. But for America, it's focused upon basically, for many Christians, uh, the evidence that God is leading them. And that's why the prosperity gospel will be so popular in the United States. Uh, it's like the a ancient Jews of Christ's time, for example, that said, Master, I mean, uh, if the rich can't go to heaven, then who is? Basically, like if you read Mark 10, a yeah. rich young ruler was sent away, you know, because he didn't live up to God. God's standard, it didn't matter what, what possessions he had. That doesn't count. Pedigree doesn't count. Riches don't count, Lord. You know, it was a real slap in the face to them to realize prosperity on this level, this temp temporal level, is nothing in God's sight. Okay. The same spirit which actuated Balaam exists in the hearts of men today. How many claim to be Christians? While well, they are as destitute of true godliness as was the presumptuous prophet. They scorn the idea of repentance toward God because they have transgressed his law. They claim Christ as their savior. While their actions show that they have not his spirit. They are at war with the sacred law of God. 
and seek to hide their wicked defection under the grace and the mercy of Christ, whose mission to earth was to vindicate the claims of his father's law. I have, he asserts, kept my father's commandments. It was the love of God toward the children of men that moved him to proclaim his law from Sinai. Because the understanding of men had become dark, there, you, because the understanding of men had become darkened by continual transgression, God in his infinite mercy condescended to bestow upon them the living oracles in all their original purity. To this law, the carnal heart is opposed, and wicked men will, like Salem, unite with the Lord's enemies in seeking to destroy his holy law and to ruin the influence of those who vindicate it. But God has preserved his great rule of right, unchanged through all the ages, like the fountain from which it springs. <clears throat> it is full of goodness, purity, and truth. Like the eye of God, it pierces through all the deceitfulness of sin, even to the discerning of the thoughts and the in intents of the heart. <clears throat> the, that the law flashes conviction on every side, sinners desired to be freed from it. And many who call themselves Christians clothe their sinful, hypocritical souls in the garments of Christ's righteousness and trample under their feet God's great rule of right. <clears throat> the worship offered to God by this class is similar to Balaam's offering in behalf of Balak. They are equally offensive to God. So in this, in this worship, if the worship offered to God by this class is similar to Balaam's offering in behalf of Balak, if Balaam is representative of the religious aspect of the United States, then who is Balak representing? Well, he should represent the civil power. So would the civil power of the United States be one that would require such an offering? What What do you mean? I mean, I mean, it's just seeking to curse, to ask Balaam to curse a group of people. And it has to be some aspect of the civil power of the United States. Well, my question, the way I'm looking at this, is it possible that Balak here could represent the papacy in some manner? Okay, but maybe that's that's maybe better. I mean, it definitely represents the pagan portion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I'm looking at her sentence and the way that it is structured. In the worship is that the worship offered to God by this class is similar to Balaam's offering in behalf of Balak. When the Sunday law is passed, is that not being offered by a false prophet? And is the false prophet then doing this on behalf of its ultimate master? Just a point to consider. Hmm. Well, yeah, see, the way I was looking at it is Balak would represent sort of a, 
a class, not a not religious class in the United States that had influenced Balaam. So I was thinking more of um, sort of scientism, that type of secular um, idea that, you know, basically controls the, um, the thinking of the ruling class. But, but I don't know. It's there's something behind this that I still don't think we quite grasp. Okay. <laughs> that law flashes conviction on every side. Sinners desire to be freed from it. And many who call themselves Christians clothe their sinful hypocritical souls in the garments of Christ's righteousness and trample under their feet God's great rule of right. The worship offered to God by this class is similar to Balaam's offering on behalf of Balak. They are equally offensive to God. So if these are equally offensive to God, we are not finding any point in this that is pleasing to God. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. <clears throat> and he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab. So, and he, Balaam, returned unto Balak. And lo, Balak stood by his burnt sacrifice. Balak and all the princes of Moab. Notwithstanding the sinfulness of Balaam's course, the Lord saw fit to convey through him a message to the king of Moab. And the words uttered were not for him alone, but were to be traced on the pages of history as an admonition and encouragement to Israel in all ages. The impatient king with the nobles and princes of Moab stood beside the smoking sacrifice, <clears throat> while around them gathered expectant multitudes, eagerly watching for the return of the prophet. He came at last, and the people waited breathlessly for the words that should paralyze forever that mysterious power working in favor of the hated Israelites. In solemn silence, they listened for him to utter the curse. He spoke. So here Balaam speaks. <clears throat> And he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, hath brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come, defy Israel. <clears throat> So Balak wants Israel cursed. Balaam continues, how shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob and number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. How do you count dust? Yes. 
What's being referred to here as the dust of Jacob? Uh, the number of the tribes of Israel. Balaam confessed that he came with the purpose of cursing Israel and strengthening the hearts of the people of Moab. But the power of the Lord rested upon him and controlled his speech. The words he uttered were directly contrary to the sentiments of his heart. In the most solemn prophecy, he pronounced blessings upon Israel while his soul was filled with curses. God had given Balaam an evidence of divine power in speaking through the dumb beast. And this wicked man was now an instrument in the hand of God, as verily as the beast had been. He had no more power to control his words no more reason to take glory to himself than had the animal upon which he rode. Now, consider for a few minutes. When it is said, curse Israel, we have another example of one that attempted to curse Israel from 1 Samuel 17, Verse 10. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. <clears throat> Who was defying the armies of Israel in this passage? That's Goliath. Yes. So. Goliath would stand against Israel of God. He stood very successfully against the Israel of Saul. But he could not stand against the God of David. He could not stand against David because he stood... <clears throat> Worshiping God as he went forward. In the book of Isaiah, we are given, stand now with thine enchantments and with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. So be thou shall be able to profit. If so, be thou mayest prevail. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Is this passage not mocking those that have turned away from God? Can I ask a question? Please go ahead. What's what's the monthly pro, 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 prognosticator? Prognosticators, yeah. What is it? Those uh, that go go ahead, dinner. Well, um, I mean, it depends on context. Here, it's referring to basically to those that are trying to uh, predict the future uh, through astrology. Um, okay. so, um, but, uh, you know, we have similar types of things nowadays. So, um, I guess you know, I'm just looking at this here. So, um, yeah, so often these are people who would, uh, observe and try to predict eclipses and things like that sort of uh, astronomical phenomena, which they believed controlled the destiny of, of the kings and so forth. All right, thank you.
In the book of Deuteronomy, we're told <clears throat> that Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heavens shall drop down dew. Throughout this, <clears throat> our Heavenly Father is showing the blessings that are provided to those like Jacob that trust in his word. Balaam was shown the, particular, the peculiar favor with which God regarded Israel and their distinctive character as his chosen people. He saw that the position to be maintained by the Israelites, a complete separation from all surrounding nations, represented the relation which all true Christians should maintain to the world. The people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. At the time these words were spoken, the Israelites had no permanent settlement. And their peculiar character, their manners, and their customs were not familiar to Balaam. Yet how strikingly was this prophecy fulfilled in the after history of this people. Through all the years of their captivity in Babylon. Through all the ages since they were dispersed among the nations. They have maintained the distinctive characteristics of their nationality and of their religion. Not only was Balaam shown the history of the Hebrew people as a nation, but he beheld their, the increase and in prosperity of the true Israel of God to the close of time. He saw the especial favor of the Most High attending his faithful and obedient people. <clears throat> the great truths which Balaam uttered were forcibly impressed upon his own mind. He saw those who love and fear God, supported by his arm, as they entered unfalteringly the dark valley of the shadow of death. And he saw them coming forth from their graves, crowned with glory, honor, and immortality. He beheld the vast multitude of holy happy ones, rejoicing in the unfading glories of the earth made new. Gazing upon the scene, the prophet exclaimed, Who can count the dust of the righteous, or number the number of the fourth part of Israel? As he sees the crowns of glory on every brow, the joy becoming from every countenance. Yeah, beaming. Beaming, sorry and looks forward to that endless life of unalloyed felicity, he utters the solemn prayer, let me die the, de the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. What a testimony is this, born before kings and princes. The light of heaven has been permitted to shine upon the prophet's mind revealing to him the purposes of God toward his people. If Balaam has a disposition to accept the light which God has given, he will now make true his words. <clears throat> he will sever at once and forever all connection with Moab. He will no longer presume upon the mercy of God, but will return to him with deep, with deep repentance and humiliation. But Balaam did no such thing. He loved the wages of unrighteousness, and, in, and this he was determined to secure at any cost. So what was Balaam's idol? Um, his wealth was, and he preferred a bribe to being right with God. 
the promise of these rewards was his idol. Now, as we, as we proceed here, and Balak said unto Balaam, what hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. I find it interesting, of course, that Balak had recognized in the prior chapter in saying, behold, there's a people come out of Egypt with covereth, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure, I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. But we are to combine this with what occurs in the next chapter. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam. <clears throat> and he smote his hands together, and Balak said unto Balaam, I called thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. So as at that point in the following chapter, we're going to find that Balaam blesses Israel and enumerates these blessings in front of Balak these three times. Why is that number three important in this situation? Well, there's going to be a fourth, so you're going to have a three-one combination. Exactly. <clears throat> and he answered and said, and he, Balaam, answered and said, must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? Balaam was not allowed to speak the words that he wanted to speak. He was to speak exactly what the Lord gave him to speak. I don't know why they use the word answered there. Um, Cause it's not really uh typical of this word um i mean it can mean answer but literally the word means to actually um uh, basically to pay attention um so the idea here anyway i, I don't know how important it is but you know he answered and said amar of course is to say and this answered here is Anna. Um, but it's just, uh, um, so it's, it's actually like a thoughtful response, I guess, is probably the best way to look at it. So, I mean, answered does work, but it, there's consideration here. He's not just saying something. Okay. I, don't, I don't know the significance of that. I just know that it's it's not um, it's not as clear in the English what that word answered means. So I mean, if they had translated, he gave uh, a thoughtful response to what has been said, and and I wonder why that is. I mean, especially if Balaam is representing the United States.
And then if Balaam's representing the United States, I mean, again, we have this thing. He's giving these oracles. Well, the United States is not giving oracles. Right. But it's involved in these oracles, in a sense, in these prophecies. So to understand these symbols, these symbols are not as as we have sort of taken them where you just say, well, Balaam represents the United States. I mean, it represents something about the United States. Right. And maybe maybe in some ways it's more similar to how we're addressing um, where we say that, you know, this doesn't refer to a person. It refers to the movement or to a message that exists. And it seems to me that that's kind of what is happening here. There's prophecy going on in regards to the United States. And we have his symbols here, but it's more about the prophecies than about who these people represent, um, if that makes sense. Uh, because they're not necessarily representing things in a direct way, it's sort of in a, um, a way in which these things are involved. I don't know how else to say it. But the United States is involved in these prophecies of Balaam. And, and we can say, if we go back to one of the basic principles that Jeff understood, dealing with um, the glorious land, that it represents the United States, not the Seventh-day Adventist Church or something like that. Um, that. That actually more aligns with this type of thinking. Because the United States now becomes this symbol, and, and you have Israel on the one hand, and you have Balaam um, representing something that, that's happening. It's like his, his, his life is an acted out prophecy regarding the United States. Maybe, maybe that's the best way to say it. Does that, does that make sense? It's got a good, a good point to it. I think we're going to have to continue to look at this to really get a, a firmer grasp as to who or what Balaam is representing at this point. Well, if we look at Ezekiel, remember when we studied Ezekiel, how Ezekiel is acting out these parables, right? Right. Um, he doesn't represent um, in any sort of specific way uh, you know, some group or some, you know, Israel or something like that, but he represents what happens to them, right? And and to different different groups and different people in different times. Uh, I mean, he's representing different things, and and maybe that's how we should understand the symbols here of Balak and Balaam, is that they're representing something that's occurring a relationship that exists with the United States and maybe the papacy or the world or the, the you know, secularism or something. But it's, it's more that he's acting out prophecy. And even when he speaks, um, this is more, you know, not that the United States is going to speak, or even when we have the ass speaking, that, you know, Islam is going to speak. But it, it symbolizes, the speaking symbolizes um, things that occur in connection with these various waymarks. And because and, and, that's what Jeff has done, is he's taken these, you know, what happened with the ass, and he's laid it out as a waymark. I don't know if he's done that with these oracles, with these parables, that in some ways maybe they parallel. Um, what happens with the ass, with the angel? I hope that's making sense to people what I'm saying. Uh, it makes sense. Uh, also, I'm thinking that just the passage of, of the Sunday law, there's got to be something 
that the U.S. regards as advantageous for them to go along with it. And if the U.N. has taken over by that time and the Pope is heading the U.N. and they're tempted of all this wonderful increased trade, increased prosperity, you know, just submit, just get rid of your constitution and submit to me, to all, all of these nations, and you will be blessed in whatever way. Well, just to kind of emphasize this point, maybe to look at it this way. So a prophet, what does a prophet do when he's in vision? What does he represent? Like Daniel, for instance, when he's um, confused about the 2300 days. Um, and there, there's other examples of this, of prophets experiencing something that's prophetic. Um, why, why is that? Why does the prophet become part of the vision? I don't know if that's the best way to ask the question. To give us an example of ourselves at the time of the end. Okay, so because it's about an experience, right? Right. right. So prophecy in, from the biblical perspective is something that is experienced. It's not merely just a prediction about what's going to happen. Um, it's about an experience that God brings his people through or individuals through uh, to instruct them. And so the prophet himself goes through an experience that is instructive. And that experience typifies an experience that he is prophesying. So, so there's something about Balaam prophesying um, that he's in a sense involved in the prophecy as a symbol. But we, we tend to try to look at, well, Balaam represents this and Balak represents that. Because somebody asked me on Messenger, you know, I think it was Messenger. But anyway, somewhere in social media about these different things. Uh, maybe it was WhatsApp. But anyway, you know, they listed all, you know, who does Balak represent? Who does Balaam represent? Who does the ass represent? All these types of things. And my answer was, well, we really haven't decided yet. But I think part of the problem that we're, we're having in trying to sort this out is I think we're taking too much of a one-to-one -one approach in that um, Balaam is a prophet being spoken to by God. He's having this experience, all of the things that are happening to him, him, him riding the ass, ass, the angel in front of him, are illustrating events that are going to happen to the United States. Um, but it's not that Balaam represents the United States. It's these actions that are happening that are illustrating American history. Uh, do you see the distinction here? I can accept the distinction. Okay. Because now when he gives these oracles, I mean, the United States doesn't give oracles, but it is involved in prophecy, just as ancient Israel is. Right. And so we know how these apply to, apply to ancient Israel. And so we then would apply them to the United States. I still don't think I've expressed myself well, but maybe as we go try to be able to see what I'm talking about. Well, as we have been working through this to make the applications, and as you're saying, as we're working through this to sort this out, we're having to look at it in multiple different manners to see is the application that we are placing upon this an application to which we can agree. Mm 
Now, this comes comes right back to the questions I've been asking. I mean, does Balaam represent more than just the United States? So the the questions that you've just recently asked, that you've just been asking the last few minutes, are going right in line with the question that I asked yesterday. So we're putting this out for everybody's comment, for everybody's consideration. Are there different ways that we can look at this? And if there are, we need to put them on the table. We need to put all of them together to see exactly how we're going to approach this. Because this is not just one or two people that are making the, that are presenting these questions. Elder Jeff was very clear. He looked that this was him being the United States. We're not saying that he was wrong, but is there more to the picture? I mean, the Millerites, after October 22nd, 1844, were disappointed. We know that there was a cornfield vision with Hiram Edson, but this was a vision that was not widely disseminated within the movement that remained. At the time of that vision, after the great disappointment, did those that remained have an understanding of the complete law of God? Or did they come to this understanding after the great disappointment? Obviously after. So in a similar way, just like the Millerites, we are examining all of these things after a period of disappointment where Elder Jeff is no longer giving a direction. So it's up to us to read, to study, and to comprehend what is going on. Now, does that make sense to those that are here at the meeting today? Does anyone have problems with what I just said? I agree. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. Right. I would agree with you. So <clears throat> we have a lot to continue and to consider in the next few minutes. Now. Well, what would, what would um, Balaam represent besides the U.S.? What would he, would he represent a church? Would it represent like a, a moon? Somebody in this movement going to, like. Well, my suggestion is that he represents the prophecies. Um, and specifically uttered by this movement. Regarding the United States. Because, you know, we've had the prophecies about Islam, but we haven't really considered his his oracles so much as having anything to do with this movement specifically. But I'm saying that because of these 777s, it refers to this movement 
in relation to these predictions that we have made. Uh, November 9th, July 18th, December 25th. When, when could it represent a false, a false um, witness in the movement? No, because these prophecies are true. So Balaam is, is saying what the Lord has told him to say. Yeah, but he's gonna he's gonna apostatize, and, and he apostatizes. Yeah, yeah, he does. But the the prophecies that he utters are correct. Right. Right, and they're bless. He's blessing Israel, not cursing them, each time. Okay. Well, I'll put my input in. It's so. <laughs> okay. And that's why I'm saying, you know, the Balaam, to just have him represent the United States, I mean, maybe we could do that in the story of the ass or something. But definitely here, it doesn't make sense other than to say that he represents prophecies regarding the United States. And that would be the case in the first story as well, in chapter 22. So when we have these oracles here, we could see how that, that would apply. Balaam is definitely much more figurative than what we had first applied. Yeah. And it's mostly his actions and his words. It's not, you know, as I said, um, just that Balaam represents some element or some, uh, you know, entity, you know, prophetically. He's representing a lot of things, but they're tied up with prophecy. Okay, I would agree. They all have to be tied up with some with a prophecy or a series of prophetic events. Yeah, and so you know the one thing that we have because I, I'm focused a lot on this seven seven altars, seven oxen, and seven um, rams. So you know, as I said in in our history. From December 21st, 2012 to December 25th, 2021, we actually have four different periods of 777 days, um, two on the on the one side and two on the other, with 183 days in between these pairs of 777 days. And, and there is a symbol there that relates to uh, the periods of seven years in the story of Jacob and Joseph. Um, which I haven't delved into in much detail, but I, I will um, at some other point because there's there's a parallel there. But we also have the 777 days at the beginning of the time of the end for this for this line for this history that is November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, 2020 or, or 1991. Pardon me. So 1989 to 1991, you have 777 days. And it could be that we can apply apply this on on that level as well, that we tie the 777 days that we have specifically marked from November 9th to December 25th, 2021, and the 777 days that are 30 years uh, before that. And, and Stephen used those 30 years to come to November 9th um, prior to hearing anything about uh, Tess is November 9th. So, so we know that we've, we've been able to tie these histories together in, in our time, the, the time of the end, to specifically events in our movement. And that's mostly how we've been looking at this. And, and, and the way that I, that I see it is that we have these prophecies that we've made, but these prophecies are typical. Nothing happened on November 9th in regard to the United States. Nothing happened on, on July 18th, 2020 in regard to the United States, or even December 25th, 2021, or March 27th, 2021. 
Now, there are external events that are occurring that are witnessing to our history, but this has primarily been internal. And since we have already made these predictions regarding Balaam, um, this movement has moved into something that it didn't, it didn't fully understand. It didn't understand that in a sense, we are a prophet. The movement is a prophet who is acting out a prophecy, just like Ezekiel would act out a prophecy, or Daniel, or Isaiah, right? Agreed. I understand now where you're coming from. Okay, good. Yeah, I hope it makes sense for people watching this, but so you saying Bel um Bel Belam is 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 this movement. Well, it's he's not, not this movement, but he's acting out a prophecy as a prophet. Right. And um, so you can't just make a direct comparison. Balaam is this movement. But you can say that what Balaam acts out, this movement has illustrated prophetically both in its internal events but also in the dates and predictions that it has made and that it's typical of something else. And this is, we've been saying for quite a few years, um, ever since Samuel Snow's letters, as we saw that Samuel Snow was typical, his letters were typical of what was going to happen to Adventism. And we saw that also with Ezekiel, that he becomes a type. And, and so Balaam becomes a type of what happens in this movement. He doesn't represent the movement, um, but he typifies it. He typifies the prophecies in both the actions that happen to him, um, but also in um, the prophecies that he gives. He's basically giving the prophecies as this movement has. And, and so if we're going to, so we if we're going on that logic then then this movement is become it's apostatized. Well, no, see that would be the that would be uh, incorrect. So for instance, Samuel Snow typifies this movement. Samuel Snow apostatizes, right? Right. Doesn't mean the movement apostatizes. Okay. So Balaam represents um, prophecies regarding this movement. He's typical of it. And this movement is involved in all of these events that happen. Balaam's personal um, uh, problems represent problems that exist within this movement. That in this movement, we can see those same types of motivations that we see in Balaam that are expressed here, correct? Right. And and what God is doing is giving us a warning so that we can learn from this. You know, he's not rejecting this movement, but he's purifying this movement because this is the everlasting gospel, a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. So you're going to have... Um, and, and remember when Jeff was doing studies about Peter, Peter represented what? What did Peter represent? He represented both the wicked and the righteous. Right. He represents the righteous and the wicked. So both of them. Yeah. And, and in a sense, we can even see that with Samuel Snow. He represents the wise and the foolish virgins. And, and his prophecies, his understanding of prophecy, leads to two different groups of people, Seventh-day Adventists and, and all the other types of Adventists. So yeah, I think this, this to me, 
this makes way more sense instead of trying to do a one-to-one -one, uh, you know typology with these different characters um, and it doesn't mean that you know as, as Dwight points out that Jeff would have been wrong because he's he's right but only partially right and and he's not partially wrong right so it's not like he's part right and part wrong he's right but it's just incomplete and I'm just referring back to where uh, Tess was trying to say that Jeff was right and wrong but truth does not mix with error he was just, just following the light he's just following the light he had at the time right so right so I mean we see this all through scripture I mean the Millerites they had some things wrong not because they were in error right in some kind of way that they're opposed to God but merely because things had not been revealed to them and assumptions or ideas from the past affected their ability to see clearly what the prophecies meant but an error is different an error is something that is intentional or deliberate yeah it, and, and I, I was going to use the word cherished in a sense that people hold on to it mm -hmm. to hide sin right. and definitely we had in this movement people who are holding on to error and as God gives this message that refines and clears up it brings light into the darkness some people love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil they hold on to their sin or to their error and they depart from the light that's given but all who embrace the light will be corrected right because what we have is the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day Amen. Yeah. so thanks for those comments William So you're going to uh, sum up this this first oracle, or are we going to move into the second with five minutes left? Well, minutes? I think I think we're going to have to sum up the first oracle. Well, I think if we use twenty three fourteen as our dividing line at the moment, okay, that this would be our place to begin again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I was looking at the comment in the chat. where it says, yes, Ellen White did say Jesus is revealed in types and symbols, and he is the center of the world, uh, center of the word. So it isn't hard to see his people's interaction with him and their rebellion and backslidings would also illustrate lessons all must learn about his character and God's hand in history from beginning to end. Now, is that 1 Corinthians 10, 11? Uh, First Corinthians 10, 11. Is that what's being referred to here? Yeah, yes, it, says, it is. Yeah. Okay. Now, all these things happen unto them for in samples or typos, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So I think the thing that we've been learning here, um, because I think what most Seventh-day Adventists think about prophecy is prophecies are about things that are going to happen in the world. But they, we don't really think about prophecy as something that's going to happen to us, that we're a part of, that we're intimately um, entangled with. You know, we, we sort of seem to think that we can sort of separate ourselves from the prophecies but but God's people move through these prophecies and illustrate um, what is happening prophetically and and this brings the prophecies really close to home at least for me um, but that was the thing that I noticed right from the beginning when I started studying the 2520 is how it encouraged me in my my own walk in seeing how God has worked in the past and that that he was working in my life 
as well, in spite of what I could, you know, see. Yes, and when it talks about Balaam, Balaam was taken here or whatever, like he's relocating while he's giving these, these, these oracles. And I'm thinking, isn't that like us? Like we're formulating these lines, we're learning lessons that God needs to teach us in our lives. And we're moving through these prophecies. We're moving through history. Mm -hmm. uh, that reminds me of something that uh, uh, Joseph Bates said. Okay. Um, and it's um, when in regard to uh, what was happening um, um, with uh, the Adventist message um, at, in, at the Exeter camp meeting. Um, uh, let me see if I can find this. Yes, he says, um, talking about the new light that was coming to Exeter, he says, on my arrival there, I passed around among the many tents to learn if there was any new light. I was asked if I was going to the Exeter tent, and I was told that they had new light there. I was soon seated among them, listening to what they called the midnight cry. This was new light, sure enough. It was the very next move in Advent history, if we moved at all, wherein Advent history could be fitly compared to that of the ten virgins in the parable. So the idea here is as we're passing through, oh, walking over the ground to fulfill prophecy, as Ellen White says, you know, here he can see that the Adventist movement is moving on. It's part of this parable of the ten virgins. And I think that's the thing that we've missed out uh, as Seventh-day Adventists when it comes to prophecy. We just don't see our part that we are playing in prophecy. It's just something that happens out there. But I think that Joseph Bates didn't see it that way. He saw us as part of prophecy. Right. I mean, prophecy, if it just occurs around us and has no impact upon us, is, is strictly an external event. But when, it, when we are beginning to realize how prophecy is to affect us, we are then able to see and experience both the internal and the external. Yeah, because I know so many Adventists, when it comes to prophecy, what they're looking at prophecy for is to know the signs so that they can actually avoid the consequences of those prophecies. Right. Right. So, you know, we got to we got to know what's going to happen so that we can be out in the country so that we're not going to be in the cities, which, of course, is a good plan. But but they don't see the part that they have to play or, you know, to avoid the Sunday law or to avoid the consequences of what's happening in the world. But of course, that's kind of a pointless uh, way of looking at things because this is about God preparing a people to stand. And if we could just avoid all the inconveniences, you know, those things, I mean, those prophetic events and somehow be out in the country and, and be sheltered from it, well, what's going to make us ready to stand and represent Christ? That is, we need to recognize that we are a part of prophecy. And, and I think that's why Adventists... You know, sure, go ahead, I'm just going to add something. Yeah, and I think that's why Adventists actually avoid looking at prophecy the way this movement has. Because this movement really has seen itself as part of prophecy. 1989, 9-11, we're the children of 9-11. We're, we're a part of this stream of prophecy. And Adventists are just... You know, hold on, I want to live in this world for now. When that Sunday law comes, you know, then I'll have to address it. But don't disturb my world right now, where we're really tied up in what's happening. Yeah, right. they're settled on their knees. Well, what yeah. I was going to add, when, when Paul was called, Christ said that he was going to show Paul all that he would suffer for his sake. 
So can you imagine being shown what you're going to suffer for Christ when you're being called? Mm. I'm thinking, yeah, we're called to suffer. It's inevitable. So we should be, pre be pre preparing for that and knowing that our Heavenly Father really cares for us. And he's doing this not because he has any pleasure in it, but because he's refining us and fitting us for heaven. It, it reminds me. It reminds me of that story that in the Bible. Where it talks the um, the husband Ben went out to um, to all the people, and they all made excuses. One made excuse. He had to do. He was just married. Went to his wife, and another one, he was um, just bought a field and needed to be plowed, and and so on and so on. That's what it reminds me of. It, of me to me. They just, we just make up excuses to not to look at it. Good point. Okay, now we have come to the close of our time together today. Do we have other comments or questions at this moment? Okay, at, when we return, we're going to finish Numbers 2313 and proceed with 2314. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, I thank you for the comments, the questions, and the interaction in today's meeting. I pray, Father, for the blessing upon each person that has attended this meeting and those that will view it later via the internet. Be with us today, help us to understand that which you would have us to do. Direct our steps, be with us in all ways. So that which is done will be more for your glory and to your character than to ours. For this opportunity, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.